If you'd like to turn to Romans chapter 13, verse 1. If you'd like to follow along with us. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. And I begin. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course, you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. This is a very popular one, uh, verse 6. Pay your taxes. Ah. Pay your taxes too, also, for these same reasons. For government workers need to be paid. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I just read that. <laughs> they are serving God in what they do. I wish. Anyway, give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Would anybody like to walk out on me right now? Now guys, <laughs> if I could skip any chapter in this Bible, I would skip this one. But I have vowed, I've made a promise to read through the entire book of Romans. And so shall I. Now what does this mean? It actually means exactly what it says. But I would like to explore this with all humility. Guys, all humility, right? I have listened to lectures on this chapter. I've read books. I've heard sermons on it. I've interviewed people older in the Lord, more experienced. I've interviewed seminary graduates, gotten their points of view on this. So I submit to you my thoughts my, the result of my study to you, I will say it, you process it as you will, and uh, it's all on you. I report, you decide. How's that? Now, it's very clear what I just read. Paul is writing to Christians who are living in the boot that looks like a boot in the Mediterranean called Rome in his time in the first century. He's saying, this is what you Christians need to do. Obey the law, and pay your taxes. You know, I mean, those are two very unpopular things with a lot of people, but hey, if you are a good citizen, a good neighbor, a law-abiding person, hey, that's a testimony to the goodness of God within you. Wouldn't you agree with that? My question is, okay, the Bible explicitly tells you this, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit deeper, when I talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my heroes. But in the Bible, is there any proviso? Is there anything in the Bible that would contradict this? Hmm. Contradict? I've heard people say to me, well, you know, that Bible, it's full of contradictions. Ever heard anybody say that to you? Full of them. What I like to say to them is, Oh, thank God. You're here to straighten me out. And I hand them a Bible and say, please, 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 show me all the contradictions. And that usually ends the argument right there. But a few Sharpies will point out something like this as a contradiction. 
Why do you Christians always want to be up in arms and against the government and complaining about society and this politician and that rule and that? Why do you Christians, you Christians, you, you know, hey, fair enough, right? That's the accusation. What say you? What say I? Am I talking contradiction here? When they come at us and they say, the Bible says, you know, the Bible you read every Sunday, obey the laws of the land, expect you know, respect all the authorities and pay your taxes. And I can't argue, it does. My question to you and my question to myself is, are there instances when a Christian should disobey the law of the land or stand up against a tyrannical dictator or a leader or a king? Is there a scripture to back me up on that? Well, I would have to say, yes, there is. And this is not a contradiction at all. What it is, is be a good citizen, you know, obey the laws of the land, providing that. Now, I'll just start with this one thing. I think it's the, I'm glad there's a really smart fellow here who can straighten me out on these things. Uh, isn't there a commandment that says, Honor thy mother and thy father. Would that be the fourth commandment? Is it? Yes, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. Uh, you know, there's only, there's only one God. I know. I, yeah, good. I'm so glad to have him here. Mr. Nodal, I appreciate that very much. Uh, you know, there's only one God. Honor the Lord. Uh, do not have any graven image. That's the controversial one. Uh, you know, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. You know, and then the first one continuing with us, I think, if I'm not mistaken, honor thy mother and thy father. Right? The first government that you will ever know in your life is mom and dad. Right? Honor your mom. Doesn't it say that? The first one. Now, you kids, are your parents in this room? Do you want to look at them and shake your head and roll your eyes now? Uh, you know, you, you, of course, Sarah, you want to do that. <laughs> look at yourself. Anyway, no, I'm telling you something. You want to honor mom and dad. Absolutely. But what if your dad is an idiot? What if mom's on drugs? I mean, I'm, that's the joke, but I'm not meaning, you know, maybe that was your case and I don't mean to make fun. What if your mom... You know, wants you to do something ungodly. Or what if dad is like saying, uh, go buy me a, a pound of marijuana today? Uh, my dad asked me to go get him cigarettes one time when I was a Christian. And uh, I, got, I got up in arms about it. You know, I'm a young Christian. I, I, thought, I shouldn't get you cigarettes, dad, because they're evil. They're sinful. Right? And he got in my face. Oh, yeah, I brought you into this world. I could take you out and start all this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? Dad's right. If dad wants me to go get him a pack of cigarettes, salute. I will do it. And I never gave him any more flack. Made an issue. You know, what's the difference whether I go get my dad a pack of cigarettes or a pack of Twinkies? Both of them are going to send him into his grave. Right? They're both of them going to clog your arteries and do whatever. Dad, if you want, hey, light up, man. Enjoy your life. I noticed this. When my dad had the nicotine flowing through his veins, he was a lot easier to get along with. Just saying. But outside of that, I honored my mom and my dad. I, I had great parents, and pff, I'm not going to stand here and complain about them. They were nuts, though, but they were mine, and I love them so much. And, and you know, I still honor them to this day. But in, in the case, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to say is the authority, the powers that be in your early life are your mom and dad. And the Bible's very clear. Honor them. Right? But what if they ask you to do something unrighteous or unholy? I mean, you have to like make a stand at one point and say, Mom, I love you. Daddy, I love you. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. Right? Is that going against Scripture? I, I don't think so. Uh, in Egypt, I read this back in the book of Exodus. The Pharaoh, who was, that's another word for king, supreme ruler in Egypt. There's a community of Hebrews who lived in the land of Goshen in Egypt. The king spoke, the pharaoh spoke, everybody's supposed to listen to him, carte blanche. Just read Romans 13, 
He's there, the powers that be, ordained of God, yada, yada. You want to listen to him, right? The Pharaoh says, you Hebrews, every time a man child is born, get rid of it, point it to death. That is the decree of the land. Kill all the boys who were born in the Hebrew camp. And the midwives, who were good Jewish girls, said, no, Pharaoh, we will not. And they didn't. They hid them, they did the best they could, but they didn't obey the laws of the land. Are we being unscriptural here? The law said this, and you resist. While you're thinking about that one. In the days where the Hebrew children were taken off into Babylon in captivity, it's recorded in the book of Daniel. Haha, <laughs> Daniel. Uh, there were three Hebrew children. Uh, Shad <laughs> I'm, I'm talking all soulful now. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? You've heard of them? When the trumpet sounds, you see that, that golden statue? Everybody bow to that statue by order of King Nebuchadnezzar. The trumpet sounds, three Hebrew children did not bow. Are they going against Romans 13 here? No. The reason, thank you, very good. <laughs> Daughter of a know-it-all, very good. Thank you. Absolutely. Doesn't the Ten Commandments tell all Hebrew children not to worship any graven image? So if the king would give you an order or an edict or a law that would go against your godly pursuits, your godly respect, and you disobey that, are you breaking the law? No. Absolutely. Well, you're breaking the law of the land, so to speak, but you're not breaking God's law. Is there a higher law than the, the laws of man? I believe so. So those three Hebrew children were thrown into a fiery furnace and God preserved them. You know that part. But they did disobey the laws of that day. Example number two. Example number three. Daniel and the lion's den. You are not to pray to anybody except giving homage to the king, King Darius at the time. Right? And it's a new fresh law. We just wrote it. The ink hasn't even dried yet. Daniel says, you know what? I'm going to obey God. I'm not going to listen to your stupid law. I've always prayed to God. I will do so three times a day. It is my way. I love the Lord. I will put myself in danger if it means it. I will worship the Lord and not obey your law. He did it. And for doing that, the powers that be <laughs> threw him in the lion's den. And of course, we know the, law, uh, the, the Lord sustained him and the lions did not eat him. So, is there a proviso for disobeying the laws of the land? Scriptural reference number three. In the New Testament, right? Peter and John. Talking about the resurrected Christ. How about how he's life-changing, how he's our Savior, how he wants to minister to all you Jews. We should, we should hear him. We should listen to him. We should all convert to him. The powers that be. Oh, no, you're not going to be around our synagogue anywhere preaching about this Jesus stuff. So they arrested them. They brought them in and they severely warned them and spanked them and beat them up and everything and threatened them and threatened them. And I believe it was Peter who said, after they were rebuked, it says, do not speak in this name again. That is our decree to you. And Peter says, should we obey you or should we obey God? That's example number four of people who would rather serve and obey God than the laws of the land. Do we have a contradiction here? Or do we have what the lawyers call a proviso? Hey, like I said, if I could have skipped this chapter, I would have. Would you get a, 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 per, a house painter from Chewton who's standing up here telling you all this heavy stuff? Wow. God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. That's all I can say. Uh, my point of view is there is a time and there is a opportunity. Hey, you've got to make a decision. Is, is it unrighteous? Does it interfere with your relationship with God? Does it go against the laws of God? Does it go against the principles of God? Question, and I'll, I'll leave that to you. Uh, 
I, I mentioned this, in Germany, in the 1930s, there was a young preacher named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Has anybody ever heard that name? He was a young pastor. He was a <clears throat> just freshly out of seminary, a Lutheran trained. Somebody, he loved the Lord, loved the Word of God, very intelligent guy. And as he's going about his ministry in Germany, something else is happening in Germany in the 1930s. There was a young fella named Adolf Hitler who was changing everything who was slowly eroding, who was becoming more and more powerful. He would make trouble just to insert himself into the trouble, to make himself more popular. And before you know it, the Kaisers were gone. Hitler is now the Chancellor, the Fuhrer of all of Germany. And one of Hitler's decrees was, you guys in the pulpit, watch it. Don't speak against me. Do not go against this government. I'm warning you. And uh, by the way, these pesky Jews, they're living in Germany. We're going to take care of them, but don't you make any trouble. That was the decree of the land. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, this is outrageous. How can, we do, how can you allow this? And he went to his fellow pastors. He went to the, the seminaries. He went to the religious leaders of Germany. He says, what is going on here? This is tyranny. This is, this is awful. We can't obey this. We can't, we can't stand for this. People's lives are being destroyed and, and, and put out of business. And these Jews, I mean, maybe we don't theologically see eye to eye with them or whatever, but we can't allow them to be carted away and destroyed and, and, and killed. We can't allow this. And as history tells us, a lot of the preachers in, in Germany during the 1930s, early 1940s, said, uh, yeah, we hear what you're saying, but uh, you're not really bothering us. It doesn't really affect us. We can still go about our business. As long as you don't make waves, we can continue situation normal. Plus, they threw Romans 13 that I just read to you. Do you hear this, Dietrich? We need to obey the laws of the land and pay our taxes and shut up and stay out of all this. Wow. And Dietrich, it didn't sit well with him. He never stopped. And I'll tell you something else outrageous. True history. He, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a minister of the word of God, became a conspirator. They launched a secret plan to assassinate Adolf Hitler. He was a part of that. Uh, the plan failed, and he was tracked down, and he was jailed. And it was weeks or days before the end of the war, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in a force march, and he was hung to death. They killed him. Why? Because he stood up against the unrighteousness and the tyranny in his country. Many other preachers of that day who did not stand up were forced to march in the concentration camps and see the heinous crime that was committed by Germany. Not just the Nazis, by Germany. Because people turned a blind eye to it. Nobody dared speak up. And the ones who did speak up were imprisoned or killed or both. This is a recent history, boys and girls. And I, as, I, as I was looking through this, I, uh, I happened across this, <clears throat> this document. It's called uh, the Declaration of uh, Independence. Ever heard of that? Anybody. Nobody even gave me a nod on that. Will you guys please wake up? I studied hard for this. You with me? Declaration of Independence. I, I, I shouldn't do this. Does anybody know how that begins? Can anybody shout it out from your pew? Well, how does the Declaration of Independence? Nope. That's the Constitution. <laughs> I got you. Aha. It's, it's so easy to find. Anybody that has a smartphone or a grandson or a granddaughter with a smartphone, however it works, or a neighbor, whatever, 
When in the course of human events, does that ring a bell with anybody? Well, it's, it's, if these schools were doing their job, it would ring a bell with you. Um, what it goes on to say, there is a time, there is a place in history, there is a place in society when you have to say, enough. And the Declaration of Independence goes on to say, we are not going to be under the iron boot of Great Britain and King George anymore. They declared independence, and on that day, everybody who signed that became most wanted. They were hunted down, they were deplatformed, they lost their fortunes, their families were disseminated, their health deteriorated, some of them were killed, many of them died penniless. Those people who signed that Declaration of Independence, I report, you decide. Did they do the right thing? Did they go against uh, Romans 13? Is there a time when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, and I, I could go on and quote more, but this is real history. I don't know. I could, there's a couple dog legs I could take here. How deep you want me to go, Frank? <laughs> Just do it. Just do it? All right. Somebody's going to want to stone me in the parking lot for this. I am a history buff. I love history. World history, American history, all that beyond. I like to read. I like to ask questions. I, and people disagree or agree on this thing. I'm going to tell you. Way back, there was a philosopher named Hegel. Anybody ever heard of him? Hegelian philosophy. Anybody ever heard of it? He actually instructed at European universities and in Germany. And his philosophy was thus. First of all, there is no God. Don't rely on God. God's a mess. God messes with people. We're enslaved to this godly thing. Get that off the table. That's what Hegel Believed, and that's what he taught in universities. Get God off the table and realize we got to take this by the horns ourselves. We have to create a fair society, right? We have our poor, we have our workers in the middle, and we got those filthy dogs who are rich. This is Hegel. This is not me. This is not Rush Limbaugh. This is nobody like that. This is Hegelian philosophy. It's in the libraries if you want to go check it for yourself. He said, what we got to do is bring the rich down and bring the poor up. And the way we do that, because these people won't listen to us, is take over and show them forcefully what they do because they're too dumb to figure it out themselves. So what we do, this is Heigl, not me. We got to cause a crisis. And we got to keep the poor people very upset. We've got to deplatform those rich people soon. This is hundreds of years ago. This went on, okay? And, and when the crisis has just about reached its head, we... Enter into it, and we solve the problem. We get power. Then everybody listens to us. And then we cause another problem. We let it fester for a while. Then we come in on our white horses, and we solve the problem. Increment by increment, we do this. And you know one of Heigl's students was named Carl? Ever heard of Karl? Uh, Karl Marx. Not one of the Marx brothers. Groucho, Zeppo, Gamo, and Chico. No. Karl Marx was a very angry young man. He was half Jewish and half Catholic. He couldn't find peace anywhere. His dad was a very successful businessman. He owned apple orchards, and he did a great business. His mom, he never quite got along with his mom. So when he was a little boy, his dad decided to get him into the synagogue so he could get ready for his bar mitzvah. But they said he's a half-breed. The Jews really didn't like him because he's not really a Jew. He's kind of a Catholic. So he really got a lot of flack. Well, so he went to 
the Catholic Mass with his mom. And they're like, he's half Jew. And the Catholics of that day called Jews Christ killers. Can you believe that? They blamed the death of Jesus on the Jews. It wasn't their fault. It was my fault. He died for my sins. Well, the Romans did. Well, you know what? He died for the sins of the world. So don't blame the Romans or the Jews. It was us. But the people that day didn't believe that. So Carl was hated by the Catholics. He felt hated. And he was dis disenfranchised by the Jews. So Carl grew up saying, Nyeh! to religion. Religion ain't going to do it. I'm angry. I hate them all. Forget about them. Religion is the opiate of the people. <gasps> he said that. It's just a cover to keep stupid people in line. Karl Marx said that. He wrote a book called The Communist Manifesto. Ever heard of it? Ever heard of it? I didn't read the whole book. I've read chapters of it. I just can't. It's just like upsetting. But so one day, I'm going to force myself. I'm going to sit down and read it. Has anybody in here ever read it? I've heard it discussed in, in high school a little bit. I've done some research on my own. Uh, the Communist Manifesto was loosely based on Hegelian philosophy. There is no God. We've got to bring down the rich, exalt the poor, but they're too stupid to figure it out. We've got to intervene. We've got to take over. We've got to show them the right way. But there's a problem. Who are the ones that are showing everybody the right way? Who are these? Well, they're the elite, the closet governments, the ones who... What? What? We got to show them the right way. Dangerous, dangerous. You throw God out of the picture. You, you, you deceive people behind their backs. You cause trouble and solve trouble at the same time. What on earth? So you got that going on. Wow, I've, I've haven't got myself in trouble yet. Declaration of Independence. Hitler, Heigl, Marx, Bonhoeffer. Three Hebrew children, Jewish midwives, the disciples of Jesus, nothing but a bunch of troublemakers. If they just sat back and obeyed the law, we wouldn't have any of this problem, would we? I'm asking. I'll tell you what, I don't have too much more to say because I'm really digging myself a deep hole here. <laughs> Studying my history, learning my history. I would like to conclude my thoughts on a fellow named Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus my Lord, the one who came into my life, loved me as I was, who has taught me and bought me with his redeeming blood. I, I love him more every day, every year. I will always serve him and respect him, and I will do my best to study this, to show myself approved a workman that need not be ashamed. And all the other stuff I just said, I want to I talk about what Jesus did. Jesus lived in a time. He came on the scene when there was an empire called Rome. And Rome started off, I don't want to say okay, they never were okay. But as they went, they deteriorated in morals. They became pantheistic, worshiping all kinds of gods, and then it got worse and worse. Then the emperor wanted to be worshipped as a god. The Caesars wanted to be worshipped. They had statues which they would erect, and you will bow and hail Caesar, or you will die, or you will go to the lions. That was the law of the land. And a lot of Christians went to the lions. But what what did Jesus have to say about that? What did Jesus do? He was born, Caesar Augustus was the ruler of the known civilized world. And he said, let the whole world be taxed and may a census be taken. Might sound evil and unrighteous, but in spite of that, Jesus was born in a small town called Bethlehem. So in spite of the evil, corrupt, a family came down. They had to register in the land of their birth, which happened to be for Joseph, Bethlehem. So no matter what this world says, no matter what corrupt leaders do or say, God is working. God never goes to sleep. 
Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not, so they would believe a lie. In spite of that, Jesus was born in the midst of a very unrighteous, ungodly, strictly, un, no, I mean, emphatically unbiblical, pantheistic, and then, you know, worship of a man. Ten Commandments is all against that. So when Jesus comes, right, he came under the politics of Rome. So during Jesus' day, soldiers walked around like they owned the place. They were brutal. They were cruel. They were intrusive. They were very high in their taxes. They were controlling. They would kick your door down, say, I'm sleeping here tonight. You guys go outside. They would kick your door down and say, what's in the fridge? It's mine. We're going to feed my troops. And if they, they came by and you had livestock, they took whatever they wanted, they slaughtered it and ate it right in front of you. And there was nothing you could do. So at the time of Jesus' birth, all the Jews in that area were upset. They were saying, if our Messiah would only come, he would put an end to this. He would crush the Romans and give us back our temple and give us back everything we wanted. So they're looking for the Messiah. They're looking for him. And meanwhile, Jesus is right there. And he's doing this and doing that. They're looking for the Messiah. Where's he at? Where's he at? And, and during this time, uh, Rome had this thing, well, like, eh, we don't want to redefine anything. We'll come to the people that we conquer. We'll, we'll get a few people that we can manipulate. And so we don't have to, to, to learn the language. So they found Jewish people who would go out and collect the taxes. People who spoke the language. People who lived in a community. And, and they would say, like Matthew. Hmm. And uh, Zacchaeus, you know, he was a wee little man. Ever heard about Zacchaeus? Tax collector, the most unpopular, lonely, hated people in the whole village. And Jesus, of course, being the righteous Son of God, he would have spit on these people. He would have kicked sand in their face. He would have pronounced judgment on them. But you know what he said? I'm coming to your house. I'm going to eat with you. What? These people worked for Rome, they were traitors. They went to their neighbors and their friends and their family's house and say, pay up and, and put a little more on top. That's for me. And I'll give Rome what they want. This is the scene Jesus came into. Did he ever uh, give the Romans a hard time? Did he ever uh, give the traitors a hard time? This is outrageous. He showed such an unworldly grace and kindness and goodness to them. He came to them as sinners. He didn't condone them. He went to Matthew and says, follow me. He went to Zacchaeus and he said, I'm going to eat at your house today. You know what Zacchaeus said after that? Everything I owe, I'm paying back and double if I have to. Zacchaeus stopped being a traitor on that day. Why? Because God showed up. God showed him grace. God showed him consideration and kindness. How did Jesus act in the midst of tyranny? He stood up and he loved. And he was undeniable. Zacchaeus, Matthew. And one day, I'll, this is even worse. You guys ready for this? Get your seatbelts on. Everybody hated Roman soldiers because they were mean and they were cruel. You don't talk to them. You don't even think about them. Yes, when they go away, you would spit on the ground that they walked on. So Jesus is with his disciples one day and a servant of a Roman soldier comes and says, my master has bidden you. His servant is sick. And the disciples are sitting around. Yeah, fat chance. <laughs> Show them, Jesus. Show them what a dog they are. Show them how evil. Yeah. And Jesus comes and says, let's go. Jesus, surely you've lost your mind. These are bad, ungodly people. And you're going to go to their house? We don't go to Romans' house. Uh-uh, no, no, no. We don't do that. Jesus says, I'm going. In the politics of Rome, in the midst of tyranny, 
he got up and says, I'm going to the Roman's house. And just before he got to the Roman's house, do you know the story? The Roman says, no, 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 master, I am not worthy that you come under my roof. All you knew is, say, all you got to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I have not found such faith. In, in all of Jerusalem, this, this Roman is, is, is showing more faith than any of you. Wow. How did Jesus deal with the politics of Rome? Well, I'll tell you what I learned. In spite of it, in spite of it, he lived large and in charge. He stood before the procurator of Rome named Pontius Pilate. And he just, he was on a mission. And, and Pilate was like, Jesus, what's the matter with you? Don't you know that I have the authority of all Rome and that I could have you crucified? And Jesus said, you have nothing over me except that we're given you from above. Uh, so your king then? My kingdom is not of this world. What? I mean, Pontius Pilate's mind was blown. I'm used to people coming in here and groveling and sniveling and begging for their lives and accusing this person and accusing that person. And doing that. But you act like you don't even care. Pilate was frightened of Jesus. He was beaten and bloody and they put a cross of, of thorns on him and they beat him up. And he stood before Pontius Pilate and Pilate was afraid of him. Because this guy... He's in the world, but he's not of it. He's talking of a kingdom. Think about it. When Jesus was in, the, in, in his ministry, he talked about a kingdom coming. He says the kingdom is near. There is a king. There is a kingdom. It is coming. It is near. Everywhere you guys go, you are ambassadors of the kingdom of God set up by Jesus, our king. This is amazing. So why I'm saying that is... This world system can get you down. It is unfair. It is unrighteous. And yeah, there's times you've got to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to follow my Lord. I'm going to follow the Bible. I love you, but I ain't doing it. Not going to do it. <laughs> you know, and if you want to call me a freak or an outcast, you want to put me in jail, or you want to feed me to the lions, whatever you want to do, I will serve the Lord. Didn't Joshua say... Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The religious leaders of Jesus' day. Jesus, you're rocking the boat here. We're friendly with the Romans. We got a good thing going here. And you're just making trouble for us. We got to put you down. The religious leaders, they forgot God? Like the Germans who are like, hey, Hitler isn't causing us any problems. Well, we'll do what we got to do to get by. There are Christians who would just sit back and say, eh, no skin off my nose, it's okay. And there's ones who will stand up and say, no, you know what, I ain't going to do this. Nope. I'll pray for my government. I'll pray for my governors. I'll pray for whatever. But I will stand on the word of God. Martin Luther, who stood before, fear of his own life, said, Martin, did you write all these books, this Protestant movement? <laughs> did you write all these? He goes, yep, I wrote them. Here I stand. I can do no less. There is a time when people who love the Lord, people who love his word, have to make a stand. That's just what it is. Didn't invent this stuff. For your part, you should be a very respectful, God-fearing. But uh, listen to the powers that be. They are ordained of God. Keep the rules. Uh, this is going to hurt. Drive the speed limit. <laughs> Pay your taxes. Obey the rules. But they're, my point is only this. And thank God I'm through this. This is a hard one. There is a time to stand up. There is a time to say, I will not bow to that statue. There's a time that you're going to have to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
as unpopular as that may sound, when in the course of human events, there comes a time. That's all I'm going to say. So I report, you decide. It's your life, it's your property, it's your business. And I've studied and I've done my best on this. Romans 13, like I said, I would have skipped it, <laughs> but I can't. So we have food next door. Please come and eat with us, dine with us, and we can talk. And you can yell at me all you want <laughs> and disagree with me. Out in the parking lot, it's full of stones. If you want to pick up a couple and lob them at me, that's fine. I'm just the guy. I'll take them. <laughs> uh, no son-in-laws. Son-in-laws may not. It's my new rule. I just invented it. But have mercy. Please don't stop praying for me. I got a lot to figure out. I don't know everything. I'm doing my best. So bow your heads and let me pray for you and dismiss you. Father, we just come before you and we love you. We will serve you. We will have no gods but you. We will honor you. We will not worship a graven image. We will not use your name in vain. We will do our best to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. We'll honor our mother and father. We'll not steal or lie or murder or cheat or covet or all the... I just got them all out of line, but you know, Lord, this is our heart to love you and to serve you in all things. So Lord, be with us and give us wisdom in these days. Give us the strength of your spirit in these days. Tell us and speak to our hearts what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And Lord, I pray for everybody in this room. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Messiah.